Get on the train Before it leaves the station The truth train is coming Gonna run them down Run them down Alrighty, hello everybody. Hey, how you doing? Okay, we're here today to talk again about Willie McRae. This is part two uh, of the the curious tale of the death of Willie McRae. And so this is a video. It was, a, uh, it was put together by... Uh, um, a, a channel, a TV channel over in England, or in the UK, I should say. And anyway, this show kind of just goes through it in 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 pretty deep, kind of gets pretty deep into some of the details and talks to a lot of people involved that knew Willie and that sort of stuff. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at this today. M one main thing here is number one, I'd like it obviously if if the Wrecking Crew and those who subscribe to my Making a Murderer channel. If they could take an interest in it, obviously, and see what maybe could be dig dug up about this, uh, would be good. But I think also, even more, even though, what also could be helpful is creating more of a worldwide awareness of what happened to Willie McRae, so that it can inform the conversation in the UK moving forward better. Because right now it's been kind of swept under uh, the rug, to so to speak, you know. Um, it's just, it's just, it ha it wasn't ever reported like really like, a, you know, very well. It was mainly, you'll, you'll see from, from what, what, what was going on with this, that it was being covered up. Everything was being withheld. Everybody was, you know, you, you couldn't get the documents about the case, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. People were trying and they couldn't. And, and. They end up losing the, the, the key evidence in the case eventually, and just it, it gets really crazy. It's, 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 there's definitely something fishy, and there's definitely something wrong with this. And so, because it has that true crime aspect, I wanted to go ahead and see if we could go ahead and just share these videos. You know, I know Stephen and Brendan have a lot of worldwide supporters, and I don't want anybody to take away from their support of Stephen and Brendan. By any means, I do not want that. But if you feel inclined, go ahead and give these videos a share and kind of kind of help to spread the awareness of this, of what happened to Willie McRae, so that, like I say, it can be well known and therefore can be a bigger factor in informing the conversation moving forward in the UK. All right, let's go ahead and get to it. This is about Willie McRae, uh, and you're going to get a lot of information out of this that's very interesting. So here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, what did we learn from this inquiry? First, I hope that all of you learned, if you hadn't known ever before, that all of you learned that you don't trust the political establishment in Scotland or in Britain. And that's lesson number one. Willie McRae was an extraordinary man. Born in 1923, he represented the Scottish National Party in four general elections and rose to become its vice chairman. During the war, he fought in France and India, became a friend of Indira Gandhi, and gave clandestine help to India's freedom fighters. His career ranged from a spell in military intelligence to helping write Israel's mercantile law. Was William McRae a man with enemies? All great people have enemies. Whether your name is Gandhi or Martin Luther King, or Jean Jury or Christ, all Greek people have enemies. Uh, I should say the establishment in the country was an enemy of Willie McRae. In 1980, at the Mulwarker inquiry, McRae played the key role in defeating plans by the UK Atomic Energy Authority to dump nuclear waste beneath the hills of Ayrshire. McRae was fated as the hero of the anti-dumping lobby and in the build-up to the 1986 inquiry into expansion at Doon Ray, that lobby was again pinning many of its hopes on his skills. But Willie McRae was never to appear. Just a few days before he died, he reckoned that he'd found something he was involved or going to be involved in an inquiry in the, into the nuclear industry um, appertaining to Scotland. And he said that he'd now got something that they wouldn't be able to wriggle out of. And he really was, he could be like that, you know, quite devilish. And he slapped the table and he was delighted. 
At the same time, McCrae expressed deep concern over the death of Hilda Murrell, who was murdered in mysterious circumstances some months earlier. She too had been preparing a case against nuclear expansion, in her case at Sizewell. It has since been claimed her death came during a bungled break-in at her Shrewsbury home by the security services. Before McRae died, his holiday home in Kintail was broken into. The same thing had happened at Murrell's holiday home in Wales, shortly before she was murdered. I don't think anything that mattered at all was taken. Willie did mention it to me because, again, he was quite gleeful o over it. He, his words to me were, they didn't get what they were looking for. We were driving round the corner on the bend of the road that we're standing b beside today, on our way to Skye, and we were hailed by somebody who turned out to be an Australian tourist who indicated that there was a car off the road and felt there was somebody in the car who was dying. And we, we left our own vehicle and proceeded down the side of the hill. We found a maroon Volvo facing back up towards the road, which had a, an SNP symbol on the front left-hand corner of the windscreen, and to my amazement, it was Willie McRae, somebody who I had known personally for many years. The next week, the papers carried the news. McRae had been in a coma for more than eight hours before being found on Saturday morning. He never regained consciousness and died in hospital early on Sunday. A few weeks later, McRae's death certificate was lodged at Register House. It contained surprising news. According to the official report, McRae had died of a gunshot wound to his head. The scenario painted by the authorities was simple. McRae was known to carry an unlicensed .22 revolver. That night, he drove while drunk and crashed. In a fit of remorse, he was already facing a second drink driving charge, he turned his gun on himself. How did the gun apparently come to be some considerable distance away? The revolver was recovered by police on the 7th of April 1985 from a burn directly below where the driver's door of the car had been. I wish further to emphasize the position of the gun when recovered. It was not found some distance from Mr. McRae's car, as has been reported. Oh yes? You want to make clear of where the gun was found? Hmm, interesting. I wonder what people that were on site say. Maybe we'll find out here. When we were removing McRae's body from the car, the policeman's hat tumbled into the, the burn below, his, below the, the driver's door. And we, I retrieved that hat personally. And if the gun was found directly below the car, then I certainly didn't see it. I wasn't looking for it, obviously, because we thought it was a simple car crash. But uh, there were six or seven people there that day. And I dare say there were innumerable members of the constabulary there later on that day. The, we found them at half past ten. So if you're trying to tell me that all these people couldn't have seen the gun before half past ten the next morning, that takes uh, some believing. Two two pistols are not a terribly powerful gun. Um, but even a powerful gun, uh, after it was fired, would simply drop to the ground. So if a gun was found a considerable distance away, it would have had to have been taken or thrown? I would have thought so, yes. And if the person had done it, was brain dead and could not throw it. Could you think of an explanation? I can't think of any explanation other than that some other party must have been involved. Scottish Eye has spoken to a senior police source central to the investigation. He claims that McRae shot himself while driving along the road. He says the car then spun off at speed and rolled several times, during which the gun fell out. That contradicts the Lord Advocate's implied scenario that McRae crashed while drunk, then shot himself and dropped the gun. But it does appear to support the suicide theory. Or does it? If McRae was brain dead when he left the road, how did the pile of papers come to be some 20 feet from the car? There were some pieces of paper ripped up, and there may have been a credit card, but I wouldn't swear by that. And how far from the car was this pile? Certainly 20 or 25 feet, going back northeasterly towards the lay-by. In fact, the, the direction the car was facing, between the car and the road. As if it had been placed there deliberately? Well, I wouldn't like to say why it was there, but it was, uh, you know, it was there, and it was in a tidy, compact bundle. It wasn't as if the paper was flying all over the place. It was... somebody had put it there. What was your reaction when it was said that he had committed suicide? I just couldn't believe it. 
Um, my wife and I were absolutely astounded at this suggestion. He couldn't have done it. Um, that wasn't w Willie, and that, that everything was going well for, for, for Willie. He did not commit suicide. I'm convinced that Willie was murdered. I don't know whether the peculiar things happened before Willie was shot or whether they happened after Willie was shot, but it just doesn't add up. That, and I'm surprised that police and inquiries and everybody else have accepted that this, you know, as somebody committing suicide. Oh, no, it's all wrong, totally wrong, the, the whole situation. There is also an argument about the site of the incident. Michael Strathairn and Peter Finlay say it took place where stands the official cairn. Coots disagrees. He maintains it took place more than a mile to the southeast. The confusion over the site matters. Coots' site is here, a few hundred yards south of the border between the Loch Arbor and Inverness districts. And different districts mean different sets of legal authorities. According to those authorities, the car was found about 25 yards off the road at the site marked by the official cairn. But Coots insists the car was much further from the road. We contacted Alan Crow, the Australian tourist first on the scene. A completely independent witness, indeed he was unaware that McCrae had been shot until we told him, he says the Volvo was more than a hundred yards off the road and he needed to use his binoculars to look at it. Significantly, he also says that the tire marks indicated that the car had not left the road at speed. As if the story was not bizarre enough, Scottish Eye has spoken to two breakdown truck operators, one based in Fort Augustus and one based in Inverness. Both separately insist that it was their company which recovered the maroon Volvo belonging to McRae. Debris collected by Michael Strathairn on his site includes a radiator grill. Yet another close friend of McRae, who did not want to appear in this program, also collected debris, including a radiator grill. So now we have no less than two sites, two breakdown trucks, and two sets of debris. We asked Northern Constabulary if there had, by some extraordinary coincidence, been a second accident involving a maroon Volvo in the area, they declined to answer. Two years after McRae's death, the Scottish National Party asked its president, Winnie Ewing MEP, herself a respected lawyer, to conduct an inquiry into the death of its former vice chair. Her investigations took a year, but persistent requests for access to Crown Office files were denied. Eventually, in her final report, Mrs Ewing concluded, I regret I cannot, as I hoped, say to the National Executive Council that I am satisfied that Willie did commit suicide. Following McRae's death, there were persistent demands for a fatal accident inquiry, but all were refused. It is a supreme irony that a Scottish patriot such as McRae was denied an inquiry which in England and Wales would have been mandatory. On the 11th of April, 1990, the new Lord Advocate, Lord Fraser of Carmyle, issued another statement deploring the continuing ill-founded speculation and discussion of increasingly fanciful and bizarre theories. Willie McRae died on Sunday the 7th of April 1985. In life this remarkable man attracted fierce loyalty and fierce enmity. But there were other aspects of his work which would have made him unpopular in some quarters. Willie McRae had a long association with militant groupings within the nationalist movement. He was associated for a time with an early version of Shiel na Gael, or Seed of the Gael, which was later expelled from the SNP because of its militaristic style. Scottish Eye spoke to Adam Busby, a leading figure in the Scottish National Liberation Army. Was Willie McRae involved in the SNLA? He was involved from February 1983 onwards. His first involvement was in the, in the attack, the letter bomb attack on the city chambers in Glasgow. This coincided with the, the visit of uh, Princess Diana and the, the letter bomb uh, exploded inside the city chambers and it cast a shadow over the royal visit. It was a great propaganda coup for us. What was his role? 
the road's fairly minor. He allowed us to use his office, and uh, we were there on various mornings. We were trying to um, discover the times of various mail deliveries within Glasgow. We actually followed postmen and so forth. Coolport military base was the next target. Busby claims that McRae approached them with a proposal that they plant two unprimed bombs on approach roads used by nuclear convoys. The bombs, they weren't inert devices, they weren't hoaxes, they were actual bombs, but the timers weren't set because we didn't want the bombs to go off, we just wanted to um, draw people's attention to the fact that these convoys could be attacked and they were therefore a risk to the public. He was no terrorist, he didn't need to use terror. He used the power of, of uh, his eloquence, the power of truth, uh, to know the man, make the situation utterly laughable. The fact remains that if McRae was even suspected of being involved with SNLA activity, then he is certainly likely to have been under surveillance. In fact, there are suggestions he was watched long before any alleged involvement with the SNLA. He, he knew he had been under surveillance, but he just didn't care. I then left McCray's office and saw a car which resembled one used by Special Branch in the immediate vicinity. It was a small, light blue car with a black vinyl top, a Triumph, I believe, and contained two men who were obviously watching me. It was almost certainly the Special Branch vehicle BGS-425S. When I reached George Square with Adam, I spotted another Special Branch vehicle, a PSG 136X. Scottish Eye has investigated ownership of these cars. One was a blocked car on the police national computer, the other has a false number. In fact, we have established that both were special branch cars based in Strathclyde. Dinsmore went on to claim that McRae had also told him of being followed to his holiday home by a brown car, registration number XSJ 432T. Scottish Eye has established that that car was a brown Chrysler owned and operated by the special branch in Strathclyde and later sold to a man in Telford. So was McRae followed on the day of his shooting? All we have to go on is what was found the next day and the official story. But for his friends, the questions remain. Okay, so that wraps up part two of the very curious tale of the death of Willie McRae. Uh, like I said, if we could just share this and make an awareness of this, of what happened, uh, that'd be also very good. If we could dig into it a little bit, and I don't know, possibly even maybe turn something up would be very interesting. I know a couple people have been messaging me today about it, so that's really cool. Um, people that don't live in Scotland, actually, so that's great. Because um, I want to create that kind of awareness of, you know, I know a lot of people in Scotland, especially people who have a vested interest in independence, already know about this. Uh, but I think a lot of pe other people don't know about it. So I think it's interesting to have people that I know from Australia and from Belgium taking an interest in it. So I find that's that's very good. So everybody, if you could, please help us share it around and just create some awareness of it, if nothing else. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'd like to see what we could find out. It may be that MI5 and the British and the UK government have, you know, basically at this point made sure there's nothing to find. That could be. But I think it might be interesting anyways. So if, if the Wrecking Crew is interested, you know, let's let's see what's going on with it and, and, and see maybe if we can turn up anything. Uh, that's about it for this one, folks. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and we'll see you. Okay.